Hello Ice and Fire Nerds, this is Chris and welcome back to Game of Thrones Season 7. Yes, winter is here. We had the first episode, so let's break that down and review Episode 1, Dragonstone. But first, let me thank you guys for stopping by the live stream last night. We had well over 4,000 people at any given time on the stream last night, and we'll continue to do that at 10.30 Eastern Standard Time after every damn show. And apparently we ended up making it to number 12 on Trending on YouTube. So that was pretty damn cool to see that. A lot of you guys stopped in, a lot of new faces. So welcome to Smokescreen. I really appreciate Appreciate you guys stopping by, and we'll see you next Sunday for episode two. But anyway, in the meantime, let's break it down and get into Game of Thrones season seven, episode one, Dragonstone. <laughs> Alright, so I gotta say right up front, I loved this premiere, it was badass and it's moving pretty damn quickly. We had a cold open this time and that means that basically the show starts before it actually comes on, before they roll the opening credits. But anyway, we saw Walter Frey stand up and immediately we knew who this was because we saw him die last year getting his damn throat slit by Arya. So Arya was playing the part of Walter Frey wearing his face. That does confirm that she does have those skills to take a face and wear it and use it and apparently speak in his voice as well, just like we saw Jack and Agar do. Pretty damn badass and the cool thing was is she used poison to kill all the important phrase as she put it and she specifically used arbor gold and that was a little shout out back to season one when danny had the attempt on her life via the wine merchant but i love the lines here when she said to the servant girl that she let live when people ask what happened here tell them the north remembers and one of my favorite lines of the whole damn show i think she used the house stark words in a way that it probably used to be used winter has come for house Frey." and then Arya drops the damn mic and walks out giving zero fucks and then we saw the infamous shot behind me here where you see winter is actually coming we saw the big icy mist roll up on the camera approaching kind of giving us the idea that while everything's going on in the south that we're going to see take place during season seven they are rolling up towards the wall and then of course we've got the infamous shot from last night where we saw three white giants that's right we're going to have white giants this year and that's going to be a dangerous thing it's not like a regular white where you can just chop him up or whatever and disable him that's going to be a difficult task for anybody and also let me say really really quickly that was not one one it was the wrong eye for one thing but remember one one died at winterfell and john had all those bodies burned he's been around long enough up north to know that you burn all the bodies of the dead so we do in fact have three white giants at least if not more and maybe we'll see ice spiders as big as hounds. And then we see Bran and Mira finally make it to the wall so Mira can stop pulling that fucking sled. I thought this was a little bit odd. It kind of happened really, really quickly. They didn't even address the issue of the mark on his arm. So apparently that may not be an issue at all. You would think though that he would kind of stop and check his arm and check the frostbite and see if that was still going to be an issue. But he basically talks Dolores said into letting them in because he does know what happened in the Fist of the First Men. He knew things that Dolores Ed knew that nobody else should know because of his green sight, but that does show that Bran has been studying on the way to the wall, although in season five there wasn't that far away to begin with. So that's one thing I didn't like about this premiere was it didn't really address the aspect of the mark. You would think Bran would at least think about it or maybe even have Mira ask about it. Wait a minute, the last time you got touched by the Night King, he attacked the cave and killed Bloodraven and our friends and Hodor. Don't you think that should be a concern? At least address that issue. Maybe we'll see that in episode two. And then we cut over to Winterfell and Jon is meeting with the Lords of the North and Sansa's up there with him as the Lady of Winterfell, so to speak, and Davos being his right-hand man. And this goes down pretty much like we predicted it would. He's basically rallying the Northern Lords. They're discussing what to do with the houses that had betrayed them and fought for Ramsay. And John held his ground and did not want to give away their castles because of the sins of their fathers. And what Sansa said did make sense in the sense there has to be some kind of punishment, but that only makes sense under normal circumstances. It was one thing to kind of call John out in front of everybody, and he actually did address that. And I'm kind of glad they had that conversation after the fact. But the point being here is Sansa would make complete sense if this was normal circumstances, but this is not normal circumstances. John is completely focused on the White Walkers and the war to come, so it makes no sense to rip a castle away from other people that can help you win that war. And it did address the question a lot of people had about the Wildlings. Instead of like offering the Dreadfort to Tormund and the Wildlings, he asked the Wildlings to go man the castles on the wall, specifically each watch by the sea, and that's going to come into play later as we saw with the Hound. Although the Dreadfort should still be an option for them later on, if they all survive. So the bottom line here is we saw the drama between Jon and Sansa pretty damn early, but I'm kind of glad they addressed that right after the fact where Sansa does show that she respects Jon, and we'll see if she continues to be power hungry and continues to try to undermine Jon in some way 
way, but John straight up said, you're trying to undermine me in front of the other lords. So I'm kind of glad they had that conversation, and I'm glad she kind of respected him in the sense of saying, you're pretty damn good at this, this whole ruling thing. So we'll see if Littlefinger has any manipulation whatsoever on her or if she's already manipulating Littlefinger. But I will say that during this scene, it was also pretty neat for Jon to say, it almost sounds like you admire her, talking about Cersei. And if you notice Sansa's hair, it does look like Cersei's did back when she had long hair in the earlier seasons, more of a Southern hairstyle. But she did say, I learned a lot from her. So I'm hoping at least that all those bad experiences she had in King's Landing with Cersei will come into play and she can use that and primarily against Littlefinger. And then we see our first scene between Cersei and Jaime. So Jaime seems to know that Cersei actually blew up the Sept of Baelor because Cersei asked if he was basically mad and said, what, are you afraid of me? And he says, should I be? So it seems to me that he already knows that she blew up the Sept of Baelor. I had thought that she would probably blame that on someone else, and that still may be the case. It really wasn't clear, so I wish they would have talked about that more, but he did try to reach out to her and talk about Tommen, but she immediately said Tommen betrayed us by killing himself, like she had nothing to do with it whatsoever. So Jamie is now starting to see her unravel, to see that she is going to be the Mad Queen. The other thing is, is we saw the justification for them to attack Highgarden, because Jamie says we need good allies, and we have to feed our men, we can't win a war without food, and that gives them the justification to go down to the Tyrells and take Highgarden, or at least try to, because he does say specifically that Highgarden has the grain and the food and all that good stuff, so they need to go take Highgarden in order to win this war. So that gives them the green light to do that and kind of justifies it, although I thought that Cersei blaming the Sept of Baelor would justify that as well. So I didn't really like that they didn't clarify that, but I guess we could see that in a later episode to see if people were actually following her knowing that she blew up the Sept of Baelor or perhaps that she blamed it on somebody else, perhaps Danny perhaps the Tyrells, we'll see, but I hope they at least clarify that. And of course, the talk about allies between Jamie and Cersei sets up Euron Greyjoy. So Cersei takes Jamie out to a balcony, and we see the Greyjoy fleet approaching, and I guess Euron found enough trees on the Iron Islands to build those thousand ships, and invited Euron to come up in there and offer her his big fleet of ships so she can win the war and rule the seas. And I gotta say, I love this Euron character. This is much closer to the Euron of the books, and he walked up in there looking like a damn cowboy. Last year, I was not impressed with Euron whatsoever. It didn't seem to be the book Euron at all, and they didn't even use the dragon horn to give him that kind of power. So they just used the ships or the fleet as a plot device to try to get Danny. But of course, Yara and Theon went and met the Dragon Queen first. So that kind of took away from Euron a bit, in my opinion. But I really liked the way he was acting. He went straight up there, right in front of Cersei, the Mountain, and Jamie, and put on a damn comedy show. I mean, he was basically roasting Jamie left and right. Jamie got in a few jabs, but not really good ones. He basically roasted Jamie right in front of him, right in front of Cersei, and Cersei started to like this. She started to smile at Euron because he's got two good hands and actually started to fall for this. So this is a little closer to book Euron where he's fucking crazy. He loves killing people, but he's a damn good manipulator and he's different around different people and it seems to start working on Cersei. So this will finally make Jamie start to realize like book Jamie that Cersei's fucking crazy, that Euron's fucking crazy, and he needs to get the hell up out of there after he chokes the damn life out of her. I really love the scene when Euron started approaching Cersei and he walked up the steps and then the mountain kind of stepped forward without even having to be told. And then he kind of looked over at him like, okay, okay, I can respect that. And then back the fuck up. But Euron put on a damn show and basically said, I won't come back to King's Landing until I have you a gift. And I think I know what that gift's going to be. And then we cut to the Citadel and see Sam and his damn chamber pot work. And that was funny as hell. They showed a lot of time passing here. And by the way, there's showed a lot of time passing between many, many scenes in this episode. So they're really going to be moving fast this season. I love the montage that showed Sam and all his duties with the food, the shit, the shitty food. It all seemed to be the same here. That was pretty damn funny, but it showed he'd been there a long, long time already working and gained access to the forbidden room with all the books that he's interested in as far as learning about the White Walkers and the original Long Night. And we finally get to meet Archmaester Ebros. Yes, apparently this is not Marwan the Mage. This is going to be Archmaester Ebros, who is more of a healer. They did confirm that in the show listing, so they didn't really name him in the show. He just called him Archmaester, so I still wasn't completely sure about that, but apparently HBO is listing him as Archmaester Ebros, so he is kind of more of a healer in the books. So it kind of makes sense if he's going to learn how to heal Jorah, for example. But anyway, he seemed to believe him in the White Walkers, but he also said that basically every time there's a big thing going on where people think it's the end of the world, 
they always survive. So I think that was kind of saying, I believe you, it's going to be a bad thing, but we will survive this. Now it won't be pretty, but we're going to survive this. And I think that was kind of basically what he was saying about the end game of the show, that the wall has been through it all. This time the wall will come down. And I think that was a little shout out to that as well. There were several little references here to the wall within this show. And I think that points to the final episode in season seven, which will be the wall coming down. Ebro seemed to believe him, but at the same time seemed to be a little bit more realistic about survival. And also the second time we visit the Citadel, Sam has come across these books. He's gained access. He's stolen the keys essentially. And he does find the books. One is called The Legend of the Long Night. And Gilly starts reading that. And I think we'll see a little bit more of that in episode two, because we did see in the trailer where she was reading about Azora High within that book. But in the book, Sam was reading, we saw the actual cat's paw dagger, and it seems to be the exact same one. If not, that was the one hell of an Easter egg, and I think that's a little hint that that may come back into play. Now, James and I did a series called A Dragon Raised by Wolves, started about a year and a half ago, and we kind of speculated that that dagger itself kind of started this whole thing with Littlefinger and Catelyn, and it may come back into the end game of this thing, and I think that could be a little Easter egg to show that. But if you read the pages of the book that they showed, and it talked about dragon glass or frozen fire being used to decorate Valyrian steel weapons, and I thought for a second when I was first reading this that I saw something about dragon glass being in Valyrian steel, but on the left hand of page, Page, what you saw from Sam's book is that Dragon Glass also has healing properties. So this is going to come play a role, I think, as far as Jorah goes. He did finally run into Jorah in the hallway when he was grabbing these food bowls up from these little isolation chambers. And Jorah specifically asked, has the Dragon Queen come to Westeros? So that tells you that Jorah's actually been there a while looking for a cure. So he's doing exactly what Danny wanted him to, going to find a cure. And we know there is a cure for Grayscale. We know Shireen got cured as a kid, although in most adults it doesn't happen. But the point being here is that Grayscale is curable. And I think Sam's going to be one to do that. Not only because Jorah was actually in the Citadel with Sam and he ran across him and he's looking for a cure, but the fact that in this book right here that Dragon Glass is not only a key to saving the world as far as killing White Walkers, but it seems to have healing properties as well. So I think Sam will discover that and help Jorah out and we'll finally see Jorah get rid of that damn rash. And then we head back to Winterfell and we see Brienne and Pod training in the yard and of course Tormund walks out and gets Brienne's attention and Pod actually smacks her in the arm and then Brienne proceeds to whip his ass anyway and Tormund comes up and says, you're a lucky man. So I really love this dialogue here. I certainly don't think anything will become of it because I don't think Brienne's really that interested. But the point being here, there was a little playful scene that kind of set up Littlefinger talking to Sansa upstairs. He started to manipulate her again or trying to, asking about her safety and happiness. And that's him trying to undermine Jon a little bit in her eyes. But I got the feeling now that after she told Brienne once she walked up and says, what the hell is he still doing here? And Sansa kind of took up for him and says we owe him because he did save us, which is true. But I do think when she said, I know exactly what he wants, that she is actually playing him. She may play the fool a few times, but hopefully this season she finally turns the page and becomes Dara Sands that we all want her to be, and hopefully ends up being the end of damn Littlefinger. But we'll see if she'll pass the sentence and swing the sword. And then we come back across Arya as she continues to travel, and she comes across some Lannister soldiers. And yes, I believe these were Lannister soldiers. A lot of people asked in the comments of the stream last night that it could have been Tarly soldiers, and it was certainly possible, but it looked to be Lannister soldiers because in the background you could see some Lannister shields leaning up against a tree but Arya comes up on these guys and this was the big Ed Shireen cameo apparently where he's singing a song which only makes sense but this was a really great scene because it actually humanized the Lannister soldiers they were wishing they were home they only serve the Lord that they follow. They're not really responsible for all the damn decision making as far as the Lords and Ladies. So in other words, they don't represent Cersei. And it started to make Arya miss home. They were talking about how they're out in the field and they wanted to go home. And that's going to be a big turning point for her, at least the beginning of a decision she's going to make to not go to King's Landing to kill Cersei, but to finally head home to Winterfell. And I believe this is the first time in the history of this show that somebody ran across somebody on the King's Road or whatever the hell road it was and actually was just nice to somebody and offered them food and didn't try to kill anybody or take their shit. And then we come across the Hound and the Brotherhood without banners and this was some of my favorite stuff of the entire episode. I really love the dynamic between the Hound, Beric, and Thoris of Mir. Really cool to see them all back together again and talking. And you can really tell by the jokes they're making they really have a mutual respect for one another. And what was really really cool here is they come across the original house where Arya and the Hound went two seasons ago and the Hound knew exactly where they were. He didn't want to go in there because he felt bad for them because he felt bad he stole their silver. But he did foreshadow this back in season five, I believe, when he said that come winter, they'll be dead. And damn sure that's exactly what happened. So the Hound was right. 
but he had a lot of respect for them and he actually went out to bury them and Thoros actually helped him do that. I thought that was a pretty damn cool scene. But the big shocker here is that during all this time they're having these conversations, he's asking about the Lord of Light. Beric really doesn't know what to say. He really doesn't understand it himself and why he keeps coming back. But Thoros asked the Hound to come over and look at the fire. And of course, this is the Hound's big thing. He's afraid of fire because of his original scars, what his brother did to him in the mountain. That's why he hates him so bad. So I thought it was pretty damn funny. Well, everything he says is funny, but in particular the line where he said something like, it's ironic that I end up with a group of fire wizards. But the big shocker here for me at least, and for a lot of people I'm sure, was the Hound actually read something in the flames, just like Stannis did back in an earlier season with Melisandre. But Stannis was kind of already there. He kind of already halfway believed in this religion because he saw some results. But the Hound didn't believe in anything, ever. And he walks over to the fire. Thoros says, take a look. What do you see? At first he sees nothing. But then he actually sees something. And it certainly points to where they're going to end up later on this season because he sees the wall. He sees a castle by the sea, which is going to be East Watch by the sea, which is likely where they're going to head later on up north. He sees a mountain that looks like an arrowhead, but the dead are walking past that or marching past it on their way way to the wall so the hound actually read the flames and that probably made a little bit of a believer out of him so although i would love to see clegane 2.0 i still love this character arc and i think it would be actually better for him if he doesn't go kill his brother he forgets about revenge and continues his trip up north to fight for something bigger and better than himself and i think he'll do that using fire but also got to say i really love the hound's burial prayer he tried to say this prayer of the seven he couldn't remember it so he ends up winging it kind of like i do here on these videos and says i'm sorry you're dead you deserve better and he drops the damn shovel and walks off so i thought that was pretty damn cool to kind of see him continue his character arc and learn that he's part of something bigger and he's starting to have a lot of respect for other people and really showing that now and at the same time maintaining his dry fucking sense of humor and finally we come to danny coming home to dragonstone this is something that people have been waiting literally 25 years to see so this was a pretty damn emotional scene as a matter of fact it was just like last year during the build-up to the Sept of Baylor being blown up there was not any dialogue whatsoever until the very end Danny approaches Dragonstone she gets off her boat she touches the beach you almost felt like you were walking in Aegon the first the Conqueror's shoes because she was literally retracing his steps in a way so you can almost feel that going on as she explored Dragonstone. You saw all the dragon statues and carvings. She walks up to the castle for the first time. She rips down the banner that Stannis had left behind like I would mentioned in one of my trailer breakdowns. But it was really really cool to see Team Targaryen back in Westeros officially now. Dragonstone looked gorgeous to me in this show. I know it's not exactly like it's described in the books as far as all the gargoyles and stuff, but this is my favorite castle of all time in this series. It looked gorgeous. These dragons are fucking huge. And what I really liked about this scene is she walks into the throne room. She looks at the throne where Aegon used to sit, apparently. She actually looks at it and then walks right by it, and Tyrion follows her into the war room as far as where Stannis used to plan his conquest. And this was the original table carved by Aegon the Conqueror. You got the idea that she was thinking about history, thinking about her ancestors, but at the same time thinking about the future. And finally, at the very end of this scene, when Tyrion and her look at each other, they look down at the table, and she says, shall we begin? And that's where the episode cuts off. So I thought that was actually really well done. I will say that it could have been a little bit more emotional, and that was probably only because of the music. So if the music was a little bit different, I think we would have got a little more feels about the whole damn thing. So maybe I'm just being a little picky. I don't know. It still felt pretty good. I think it just could have been a little bit better because this was a big, big moment for a lot of people. But anyway, guys, that's all I have. I really, really love this episode. This is one of the best premieres, I think. You're seeing all this stuff kind of come together. They're definitely going to be moving at hyper speed this year. So you're going to have to kind of keep up with the locations of where people are and how much time has passed. They jumped right into a cold opening and got right to the damn story. Didn't have to worry about some kind of recap episode like an episode 10.5. Let me know what you think in the comments below. How did you like Game of Thrones Season 7 Episode 1 Dragonstone? We've been waiting about a year and a half for this. It's finally here. And just think about it. Six more weeks and this whole damn thing's over and our wait begins again. Anyway, guys, let me know what you think in the comments below. Thank you for all the support. I really, really appreciate it, especially to you guys on Patreon. And a huge shout out to my executive Patreon smokescreen producers, Paul Scriffin, Fall Guy 10, La La Gig, Kisa Powell, Mark Joseph, Marilyn Bentley, Joanna, Sean Hayes, Anonymous, 
Doc Holliday, Gaska, Hoon Jive, Kieran D20, Nikki Snow, Low Horton, Aaron Habig, and Ashley May. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate the support. And to everybody out there in YouTube land, I really appreciate the support, all the likes, shares, and subscriptions, etc. And again, be sure to join us Sunday nights at 1030 Eastern Standard Time right after the show for our live review and recap on each episode. So be sure to join us then. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it. Be sure to subscribe to Get Her Thing and be sure to click that damn notification bell so you're notified when I drop a new video. Thanks for watching, you guys, and we'll see you next time.